So I do want to start here uh, as close to being on time as possible so that we have more time for questions and observations at the end, if I get done with the material <laughs> that I'd like to get through. So, um, some, no, so um, what I do is um, I send out a Zoom invite to, uh, we have an email list of those who want to be on the email list for this class. So if you're not on the email list and you want to be, um, you need to get your email address to me so that I can put you on the email list. Then um, each class is um, participable, not only in person, but also by way of Zoom. So um, I send out the Zoom invitation Oh, either the evening before or the day of. And I send it, obviously, to the email. So if you're not able to be here, but you want to be participating in the class, um, you can participate by way of Zoom. It is also my practice to um, send out the text as an attachment, as a PDF, um, to all the students that are on the email list. And you can print out that text in your at home or if you don't have um, a printer, you know, or whatever, um, I, I make extra copies to hand out. So, Marissa, did you get a copy? Okay. Now, um, I guess I was never in a class where the professor handed out his lecture notes. And these are more than notes. These are actually the text. <laughs> but uh, the reason I do this Nick, are you on the email list for the students? Yes. Okay, so you got the you got the PDF. The reason I do this actually is because uh, this I, I want to make sure that you retain the material. I don't want to, you know, I don't want you to forget what I what I said. Um, that's one reason. So you know, if you're thinking back, well, what did Father Paul say? I thought he said this. Well, you can go back to the text. You can go back to the text. Also, um, some people learn better or best by reading only. Some learn best by hearing. Some learn best by doing both. Some have to do something tangible, like take notes. Um, so, but with this, uh, all options, all learning styles are available to you. It is also that, in my opinion, that um, Probably for many of you, if not most of you, if not all of you, <laughs> even the cradles, um, what were, you know, the, 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 the teaching of the Orthodox Christian faith simply is not known, shall we say, for many reasons. Um, therefore, the material can be, you know, and so as a result, we absorb the Understandings, the religious, the the, the, the the religious understandings that are out there, and they're not orthodox. And so um, we have these uh, filters that have been built in our mind through which we hear what I'm saying, what the Orthodox Church says. Are you Natalie? You look different for some reason this morning. Must be your glasses. And the glasses. Okay, you did not get this. No, not yet. So here it is. I'm explaining why I hand this out right okay, now. And if you want to be on our email list, you need to get me your email okay. so that I can, so that you'll get the notices and the Zoom invite. Hopefully, one, you don't need it, but in case you do. And then you also get this as an attachment that I send out nice. before each class. Um, but anyways, I was saying the material may be um, uh, uh, not just new, but maybe even um, surprising to you. Such that you may not know how to formulate a question. But if you have the text in front of you, you can go back and, and review what you just heard. And then perhaps frame your question more precisely. Um, but also, if you have this text in front of you, you can go over it at home several times. <laughs> um, because again, you know, uh, when the mind is conditioned when it's shaped in a, a mind that is not of the church, 
then it, it takes a bit for the church's mind to, you know, roll the stone away so that the mind of the church can get into my mind. So that's, those are the reasons that I hand out the text. And it does feel a bit strange to me because, as I said, I never have taken a class in which the professor handed out exactly what he's going to say. Having said that, however, I might also add that this may not be exactly what I'm going to say. I'm known to going, for going off script um, because there's just so much. And I have to restrain myself from going off script because, you know, it's like going, going into the Orthodox faith is like going into this, is this lush garden. Um, and you just, it's so easy to get distracted by all the beautiful flowers that are around you. You want to go, you know, you see this beautiful flower, you want to go off this way, you see this beautiful flower, you want to go this way. First thing you know, you're, lo you're, you know, it's, it, you're lost in the garden. It's a good place to be lost. But your intention was to get over there, but in fact, you're over here because you went like this, you know. So I have to restrain myself and I have to try to remember that, um, that for many of you, this is completely, completely new material. So that uh, I need to um, try to toe the mark and stay on the path so that I don't get you lost uh, more than you might already be. All right, so let's uh, begin with a, a prayer. Christian, do you need a text? Okay, so let's uh, stand and we'll say a prayer. We face the east when we pray in the church. Um, Wycliffe, why do you think we face the east? Why do we face the east? Yes. Because that's the beginning of the church, I guess. Natalie, any ideas? What happens in the east? Sunrise. Thank you, Marissa. Why do we face the east? The sun is an image of who? Christ. Christ. What does that tell you? Already. This is a theological principle already, guys. Creation. Creation is entwined with the mystery of Christ. It's not separate from Christ. So it's not just that the sun is rising from the east. Somehow the, the, the sun rising in the east is a participation in the mystery of Christ's resurrection. So you see how the resurrection is not only spiritual, quote-unquote, it's also physical. It's also geographical. All right, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. O heavenly King, the Comforter, the Spirit of Truth, who art ever we're present, filling all things, treasure your blessings and giver of life, come and abide in us and cleanse us from every impurity, and save our souls of the Lord. Christ is in our midst. He is never shall be. As we proceed... Feel free to raise your hand and interject or interrupt if uh, there's something that you want to um, um, want to um, talk at, talk about at more length, or if there's something that's confusing to you and you want me to help, want me to clarify it as best I can. Otherwise, we'll proceed. And uh, here we go. So, welcome, welcome to our catechism class. So, in these catechism classes, we will be we will be preparing to embark on a noetic journey into the mystery of God hidden from the ages. Now, what does noetic mean? Of the mind. So an intellective journey. Uh, um, and the mystery of God hidden from the ages is Christ in you, the hope of glory. That's Colossians 1.27. Now, I want to be sure that we're hearing what's being said here. So let me state it several times now, in different ways, to stamp it in your mind, in your noose. The goal of our catechism is to bring us to biblical faith. Biblical faith, you can underline that word, biblical faith. That we may align, you can underline that word, <laughs> our inner man. You can underline those words, you might as well just underline the whole sentence. So we, can, we, can, uh, we, we may align our inner man with Christ. That is to say, so that we can align, you know, the image of God that we are, small i, with the image of God, the capital I, who is Jesus Christ. Colossians 1.15, Christ is the icon of the invisible God. According, so according to, according, uh, see, we were created, we, were, we, were, we came to be, according to or in the image of Christ. 
So, we, you know, the fathers will say, this can become, this can be a marginal note, if you'd like, on the side. The fathers will um, say that man is the image, small i, of the image, capital I. Um, origin of Alexandria, um, I think, captured the very essence of the Christian, of the, of the biblical faith. Um, and it's just absolutely, I, it's, I, it's a wonderful little saying. He says, our primary, this is origin of Alexandria, he was not a saint, um, but he said a lot of good things. And he was, uh, let's say he flourished, let's say 250. Um, our primary substance, he says, is our having been made in the image of God. And capitalize that. Which is Christ. You see how he is combining Colossians 1.15 and Genesis 1, 26 to 28, where he's 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 interpreting Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image. Um, from Colossians 1.15. Christ is the icon of the invisible God. Because you see, who is our image? Christ, the Son of God. And obviously, who's the, uh, let us, who's the us? Modern scholarship would like to say the heavenly council constituted of the whole of the Father and the angels. It's the Holy Trinity. Angels don't create it's the Holy Trinity, is the us, in Genesis 1, 26 through 28. So you see, I've already gone off script. Um, but this gives you, what I love, what's, what's so beautiful about this is that you notice. Now, now Origen is, he's, he's, he's promulgating this, he's, he's, he's saying this, um, in this in the third century, and about, uh, you know, this is, this is a, a time of, of, you know, intense, uh, let's say, philosophical activity. And uh, one of the questions, if not the big question that was circulating around at that time is it was, you know, it was probably Plotinus who, who actually was a classmate of Origen. It may, it may be have been that Plotinus was articulating this, this big question when he writes in his Aeneids, um, what am I? What is man? What is man? Underline the word what. What is man? Uh, it's not in there, Natalie. There's nothing to underline. <laughs> um, and many answers were proposed. You know, you know them all. Air, fire, earth, water, um, the circle, which would actually be the, um, you know, probably the Ouroboros, you know, the serpent swallowing its tail. Or it might just be the, um, the round, the great round from um, birth, life, death. Birth, life. Always going back into the tomb. Uh, this was the this was these were um, um, presented as as the essence of man. Um, another one might be numbers, you know, number, the tetractus, as in as uh, as as the as the uh, image of reality. You know, the, the tetractus was a pyramid of uh, of dots like this. Um, and then you, know, you, can, you can do all kinds of, of uh, geometrical uh, ratios and uh, relationships between these dots, and it's quite fascinating, actually. It can, it, it's a very fascinating philosophical study. But the point is, you see how different this is from all of these solutions that were being proposed in uh, pagan philosophy. Our primary substance is not a what. It's actually a movement. It's a dyna it's, it's dynamic. It's it's a, it's an action, and it's an action that proceeds from and um, takes place in a mystery of communion. Our having been made in the image of God. Our essence is not flesh, blood, whatever. It's our having been brought into being. I mean. If, you can't even wrap your mind around that because there's nothing to wrap your mind around. It's a, it, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful uh, way of explaining the mystery of man. 
that our primary substance is to be in God. And so to say that, uh, going back now to script, going back to a line, a line eight and nine, the goal of our catechism is to bring us to biblical faith that we may align our inner man with Christ. Our inner man is the image that we are, that we are with the image of God, the one in whom we were created, according to or in whom we were made, so that we may become one with God. Can you understand? Um, this word aligned, I use that word intentionally. I don't know if you'll ever, you'll find it anywhere in the Bible, but I use that word intentionally. Uh, those of us who love cars, you know exactly what I'm talking about when I say alignment. You align those tires perfectly so that the ride is smooth. <laughs> If they're off just a little bit, there's the vibration and the car, can, and you have to fight the car to get, get it going down straight. So if I'm a lot, so, if, so um, biblical faith is this movement of bringing my inner man, the hidden man of the heart, St. Peter would call it, um, in alignment, in line with Christ, so that I'm not going this way or that way, even a little bit. I'm wholly aligned with Christ. And can you see how that is absolutely natural to us. It is not unnatural. Because that's how we were created. We were not created in disalignment with Christ. Let's continue. We'll let others speak for themselves, and you may decide whose purpose you wish to pursue. But I wish you to hear from the outset, and to understand in due time, you may not understand it today, you may not understand it next month even. It may take a while for you to understand it, and that's okay. But I wish you to hear from the, under, from the outset and to understand in due time that for the Orthodox Church, the purpose of catechetical instruction is to show us how to believe in Jesus Christ that we may have life in his name and through faith in him become one with God as partakers of Christ, that's from Hebrews, and communicants of the divine nature. That's from 2 Peter. So our purpose is to train ourselves in the way, or I, you know, I suppose to bring this into us, into what syntactical um, uh, orthodoxy, I should say, my purpose is to train us <laughs> in the way of the cross, that in due time we may be filled with the glory of the Holy Spirit, who overshadows the church and fills it. And now get this, this, these next three lines are important. And he fills the church as he did the tabernacle of Moses. Remember that story? Moses builds the tabernacle and the Holy Spirit descends upon the tabernacle as a cloud of glory. And he fills the tabernacle so that no one can enter, not even Moses. And as he did with the temple of Solomon, where the same thing happened, and as he did Adam in the beginning, remember? Um, he fashions Adam from the dust of the ground. And then what does he do? He fills him with his Holy Spirit, <coughs> his glory. But get this. And as he did in these last days with the Holy Virgin Theopolis. Luke 1.35. The verb there for when the angel says to the virgin, the Holy Spirit will overshadow you is the same verb that's used in Exodus, whatever it is, chapter 41, verse 30, it's the, la it's the, it's the last two verses of the, of, the, of the book of Exodus. It's the same verb for, for, the, for the cloud of glory, the cloud of the Holy Spirit overshadowing the tabernacle. What does that tell you about the Virgin Mary? What does that tell you? She's the tabernacle. She, exactly, she's the tabernacle. She's the tabernacle of which Moses' tabernacle and, well, let's say, I think you could say it this way. She's the tabernacle. She is the living tabernacle of which Moses' tabernacle is the image, the shadow. And I think, I'd have to think about this, but you might say that Solomon's temple, which was built of stone, is the image of the temple of Christ's body which comes from the tabernacle of the Virgin Mary. 
the point, you see this. The tabernacle was a moving temple. And it accompanied Israel on her exodus to the promised land. When she gets to the promised land, Solomon builds a permanent temple of stone. You get it? <laughs> Mary is the moving temple. She gives to Christ, she gives to the Lord God uh, a body from her own substance, her own blood. And in that body, in that tabernacle, the Lord moves around Galilee. And in fact, in John 1.14, um, you, you know, you don't catch this in the English. But it says, the word of God, the word became flesh. And then the verb is, and um, es he nomata, es eskinomasin, or something, eskinomen, uh, eskino, eskinosis, whatever the verb is. The verb is taken from skino. What is it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. That makes a big difference for us, right? Skimi mm -hmm. <laughs> is the verb for tent or tabernacle. And so the, it's a word that's used for Moses, for the tabernacle that Moses built or made. So it's literally, St. John is literally saying that uh, he tabernacled, you know, he established his tabernacle among us. And then what does the Lord say to the Pharisees? In John, it's John chapter 2, verses 19 through 21. He says, destroy this, this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. Um, and then, you know, and then you know, frequently throughout the Gospels and in the epistles, as also in the uh, services of the church, um, you hear us referring, you hear the reference to the psalm where it says, um, the, the, the stone which the builder has rejected has become the head of the corner. And it, this is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. Do you understand? The stone is the body of Christ that was laid in the ground and became the cornerstone of this temple that is now of stone. In other words, it's immovable. It's adamantine. Um, and it stretches from the lowest parts of hell to the highest part of heaven. So you see, so from this you can see, uh, already you can begin to catch, you know, I don't know, however you're feeling about this, um, I find my um, I find myself feeling a little bit of a thrill because it's just like it's going on, you know, it's, it, this is so, uh, so profound, it's so beautiful. Um, I just feel a bit of a, you know, it, it's so... Um, but you see in this how the whole of the Old Testament is actually an icon, it's an image of the shadow of Christ and his incarnation. Not two separate stories, but the one story that is the preface to the other. This is the main story, the New Testament. And the whole of the Old Testament is the image of the New Testament. Rob? I got to say, it's just, it's just a great point. You know, all our Protestant filters these days, yeah. I know my background where John is up, Old Testament, old, forget about it. Christ came, New Testament, that's yeah. what we're supposed yeah. to do. Forget about the Old Testament, yeah. I was an angry God. We got to yeah, 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 yeah. Right yeah. I think that, that distinction is very important. Yeah, yeah you're absolutely right. The, because that's there a bunch no of separation from all exactly. It's all because that's a bunch of baloney. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's just absolute baloney. I can get worked up over it. So let's because it's wrong, and it's led how many people to just to just wrong understandings, which in turn have led many people to leave the church. I was one of them. Um, so our purpose is to train us in the way of the cross that in two time, well, I already, I'm sorry, I already did this. this. This business, for lack of a better word, this business of being filled with the glory of the Holy Spirit who overshadows the church, which is the body of Christ, right? It's not a human organization. It's not a meeting of people of the like mind, but it's the body of Christ. So that those who are looking for salvation outside the church they're not going to find it. They're just not going to find it. Um, 
Our purpose is to train us in the way of the cross, that in due time we may... F I keep reading that. It must be an important paragraph, because I keep going back to it. We call this theosis. You know, uh, becoming gods. Not by nature, but by grace. Or another word in the Bible is by adoption. Uh, but we become truly sons of God. Children of... Become children of... But sons of God... We know we become gods. Sons of the Most High. Psalm 82, 6. We become gods. Sons of the Most High. The Lord himself quotes that psalm to the Jews. Um, and this theosis, this business of becoming so one with God that we become God, we become children of God, just like you are one with your parents as their child. Um, this is the essence of biblical salvation. In fact, it's the goal and purpose of human life. Deifying us is what the Orthodox Church is all about. Our purpose in the Orthodox Church, for all of us, whether you're a, an enrolled catechumen or a baptized faithful, our purpose in the Orthodox Church is to draw near in the fear of God with faith and in love, that we may be clothed with the wedding garment. And the wedding garment is this glory of the Holy Spirit that we read about throughout the whole Bible, not just in the New Testament. And we become communicants of life eternal at the marriage banquet of the Spirit and His Bride, who is the Church. Now this banquet, this marriage banquet, in its mystical deifying essence, is not held on this side of the grave. It's not held on this grave, on this side of the grave. This is an evangelical riddle, a biblical koan. You know the word koan? You, you run into the word koan? The far, it's the term in the Far East that they like to throw around. Uh, 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 an enigmatic saying. Um, I like to use it because it sounds so exotic. Um, it's a biblical koan. See, we have our own koans, our own riddles. Um, because you've witnessed, that you've witnessed the great banquet, the divine liturgy, being held on this side as the Holy Eucharist of the divine liturgy. But we, we, you know, we, we need to you know, understand that what you're seeing up there in the divine liturgy is the visible veil. It's a visible veil that hides even as it reveals the invisible mystery that's taking place on the other side. That is, when the faithful partake of the visible forms of the divine liturgy on this side, they are not partaking of something earthly that, um, that is like the reality on the other side. They are partaking of the heavenly reality on the other side. For the great hall in which the banquet is served is on the other side in the kingdom of heaven but now get this this is the kicker in the kingdom of heaven that is within you I want you to catch that the other side is what it's saying catch the logic of this the other side is in you it's in you that means it's not foreign to you now, but perhaps to uh, help you understand the riddle, this, is, this, this riddle is captured in the mystery of Holy Eucharist, is it not? Because the bread, what we're eating on this side is bread and wine. You look at it, even after the consecration, it's still bread. It acts like bread. It smells like bread. It tastes like bread. The wine, is, it still looks like wine. It tastes like wine. It acts like wine. But somehow, that bread and wine, which are still, you know, they still maintain their original integrity, their original natural integrity. They don't change to become something else. Just like when, they, uh, when, when God the Word took, it, took the flesh from the Virgin Mary, the flesh didn't become something else. It was still flesh. It was still you know, flesh and blood. It was still our human nature. It was not changed. But it was cleansed and became its true self, its true nature. So also the bread and the wine somehow become the body and blood of Christ that has risen from the dead. In other words, it's the body and blood of the Christ who was risen and is ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. So I, can, can, do you, you see what I'm trying to say. It's a concept, even if you've not experienced it by actually partaking of the divine liturgy, I think nonetheless it's a concept that our minds can grasp. 
Um, when you partake of Holy Eucharist, you're partaking of the Christ on this side, you know, and stuff of this side, but its origin, its substance, its source is not on this side. It comes from the other side. To gain that great hall that is deep within us and the deep beyond all things. Here I'm quoting Jeremiah 17, 9, as he is uh, in the Greek, in the Septuagint, which at some point we can explain. I'm not going to take the time to explain the Septuagint right now, um, except to say that it's the Greek translation of the Hebrew Bible. Um, to gain that great hall deep within us and the deep beyond all things. In other words, on the other side, we must lose our life for, this, for the Lord's sake. In other words, out of love for him who first loved us. That means that we must of our own free will take up our cross to put to death what's earthly in us. You see, what's earthly in us, what's on this side, that is not, been, that is not the, to, put to, death, to put to death what's, what, what in us on this side is not in alignment with Christ. Um, and to unite, and, 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 uh, and to uh, prepare ourselves, I said, where are we? Yeah, uh, where are we? Okay. Uh, we must of our own free will take up our cross to put to death what's earthly in us. Now what's earthly in us would be our idolatry. Our love for the darkness rather than the light. Uh, by dying daily in the likeness of Christ's death, in other words, by participating in Christ's death, by putting to death what's earthly in us, we follow the Lord into his tomb, where with Mary Magdalene we find him in the garden of his resurrection. Let's tie all this together now. Let's say that the purpose of an Orthodox catechism is to prepare its students to unite themselves to Christ in the likeness of his death, that they may be united to him in the likeness of his resurrection. You might put a marginal note here. I don't know if I got to this later on or not, but it's good for us to understand right now that in the Bible, you know, to be in the likeness of or to, you know, to likeness, uh, can mean to participate in. So when St. Paul says that we were baptized into Christ in the likeness of his death, what, what, the way we understand that is that we were baptized into Christ uh, and were made to be partakers or to be participants in his death. And how do we participate in Christ's death? By taking up our cross. These would be the ascetical disciplines of the church. Taking up our cross for the purpose of putting to death what's earthly in us. In other words, our idolatry. And our idolatry would be our love for the things of the flesh. Namely, things like lust, greed, anger, envy, um, jealousy, uh, wrath, da 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 Remember St. Paul says in Colossians, I think it's chapter 3, verse 5, uh, put to death... Put to death, um, let's see, how does he say, uh, 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 crucify your earthly members. Crucify your earthly members. And then how, to, how he goes on, and he, and he goes on to list the earthly members that we are supposed to crucify. Is it your fingers, you know, your hands, your arms? No, it's not, it's not your body. It's the things that accrue to your body, like parasites, and, uh, and corrupt your body. They're, they're spiritual evils, like uh, what we just named. Lust, these are the things that St. Paul names. Lust, greed, anger, um, you know, fornication, uh, homosexuality, um, malice, anger, wrath, all of those things. These are the things that are earthy, and these are the idols. These are the idols that we go after, and this going after them, that's sin. The word in Greek for sin is to fall away from not to hit the mark, to miss the mark. So obviously if the mark, if the target is Christ, then when I draw from him, I have missed the mark. I have fallen into sin. And my arrow just kind of goes onto the ground, right? Goes back into the dust where I came from. And there it disintegrates. If I leave it there, it will disintegrate back into the dust. Um... Our purpose, going on line 50 now, our purpose, that is to say, is to prepare each catechumen for the sacramental mysteries of holy baptism and or chrismation. In those visible rites, 
seen by the bodily eyes on this side of the grave. The believer is led mystically, in other words, really, in truth, or invisibly, um, into the mystery, into the mystery, the deep that is beyond all things, beyond the gates of birth and death, where is found our origin and our end, our true nature and destiny, who is Jesus Christ, who is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This mystery, this is the mystery of God hidden from the ages, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. I want to I want to spend a little bit of, just call this, hopefully not too long, on this word mystery. I want to go into it a little bit more. This is a beautiful word. This is one of my favorite words. And the etymology here is one of my favorite etymologies. It comes from the root mu. And way, way, way back when, when it was just used in you know, simple terms, at least according to my sources. Who knows, it? Who knows if they know what they're talking about? But according to my sources, and they all have consonants, a lot of consonants after their name. So that means that they're really smart. <laughs> um, the word means to close. And it could be used, it was used for the, gill, the, fish, the gills of a fish in the water. As the, gill opens, as the fish opens its gills and closes its gills. You know, it's, it's breathing in the water. So that was its original you know, uh, foundational meaning, meaning, as I understand the sources that I've looked at. But it, when, as, it, as it migrates into a religious setting, it comes to refer, fascinatingly, to that realm that you could liken to an ocean. So let's draw, here's this life as an island. And then in this life, uh, surrounding this, uh, the island of this life, you know, is the ocean. The deep, unfathomable ocean where all of these fishies swim, opening and closing their gills as they breathe in the water. So um, it comes with, as it, so you know, I say it this way, as the word mu um, migrates from the waters and climbs onto the, onto the land like these fishes, do you know that they're, they're, the, they're supposed to have been the first creatures that climbed onto the land and then, you know, developed into whatever. Um, just like that, as it migrates onto the island and takes on a religious sense, it does not lose its meaning of closed. But now, the way, now what it's talking about when it talks about closed, it's talking about this realm out here in the ocean that's closed off to you, absolutely shut tight. Um, because it's closed off by the gates of birth. So, you know, by a birth, let's put the gate right there. A birth, you come, out of the, you come out of the mystery, through onto the island of life, through the gate of your birth. You live a while around up here, and you do your thing, and then finally you die, and you go back through the gates of death into the mystery. So this realm right here, is where you find your origin and your end. And you can't see that because you cannot see beyond the gates of your birth and your death. So that's the mystery. Now this opens on to a very fascinating study that we cannot allow ourselves to go too far into. But you know you hear in the New Testament of all the eyewitnesses of Christ because he is the mystery he's your origin he's your end and those who are initiated into the mysteries of Christ are those whose eyes are open and it's interesting to me it's fascinating to me I found at least two places in the New Testament I think it's St. Luke and St. Peter where the, the, the verb that they use no I think it's a noun that they use to describe um, seeing Christ is the same word that's used in the so-called mystery religions. It's the word that means eyes opened. If you're if you're a, if you're if you're not initiated into the mysteries, your eyes are still closed, and you cannot see into the mystery to see where you came from and where you're going. But once you've been initiated into the mysteries, your eyes are open. And you become one who's of opened eyes. Because now you can see into the mystery. And you can see your origin. You can see your end, where you came from, where you're going. 
So um, Christ, so you know, so so let's see, let's, let's go back here. Um, in these in the visible rites of the church, seen by the bodily eyes, so in other words, by everyone, everybody can see what's going on in the church, visibly. Um, because you know, what's happening is on this side of the grave. But in those visible rites, the believer is led mystically, invisibly, secretly. Um, nobody can see this, this, this being led into the mystery that is deep beyond all things in the ocean, um, beyond the gates of birth and death, where is found our origin and our end, our true nature and destiny, who is Jesus Christ. What happens in baptism, dear ones? What happens in baptism? Are you not first put to death in Christ? And in that same instant, you are born from above in Christ. Baptism is the gate into the mystery, the real mystery. So that when you come up out of the waters, you're not in Kansas anymore. Mystically, invisibly. You are in the mystery. And we call the sacraments of the church, in the Orthodox Church, we don't call them sacraments. I mean, they are sacraments. You know, sacrament has the meaning of, of an oath. So we call them sacraments because at the, sac at the sacrament of baptism, you've taken an oath that you're going to unite yourself to Christ. Like, you know, you took an oath when you got married. You're going to unite yourself to this gal. But we call it, but it's, it's not just a sacrament. It's, we also call it the mysteries, the mysteries, because their origin, the origin of those sacraments, is not out here. The origin is in the mystery, in the mystery of Christ incarnate, even Christ incarnate. Do you see? Christ, who was on the other side, who was in the mystery, becomes flesh. On this side, he becomes visible. You know, he has form. He has a certain height. He has a certain weight. <laughs> He has a certain facial feature so that we can draw icons of him. And when we draw icons of him, we're drawing icons of the invisible God who became visible to us in the flesh, born of the Virgin Mary. So even Christ himself is the bridge that unites this side to the other side. So that if you're in Christ on this side, you're also on the other side. That's why, I'm off script now, um, that's why in the marriage ceremony there is no formula till death do us part. Because Christ has destroyed death. There is no death. You died in your baptism. And so, you know, yeah, when you die, physically, whatever, um, that is not your death. That's the death of the old man in you. That's the death of death. That's the death of, the, of, the, of this body of death. Um, but you, in your inner essence, you are still, you are alive in Christ. You don't die with your body. You are alive with Christ. So when you come into the church, you are stepping into this life, this life of Christ that was incarnate in our body. You are stepping into this life that does not die. So, this, so that you know, the Lord can say to Mary and Martha at the tomb of Lazarus, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, even though he dies, yet shall he live. It's a riddle. It's a riddle. The profane mind can't understand it. It's a riddle. Uh, but this is what's happening to us in the church. And so uh, the purpose of an orthodox catechism, going back up to line 47, um, is to prepare us to unite ourselves to Christ in the likeness of his death, that we may be united to him in the likeness of his resurrection. Uh, let's see, I said something else over here. Um, um, somewhere I said that we may learn that we may learn how to believe in Christ that we may have life in his name uh, oh yes line, uh, line thir 14 13 and 14 um, the purpose of catechetical instruction is to show us how to believe in Jesus Christ that we may have life in his name you could also trans understand that now on the basis of this, uh, these uh, illustrations that I've given, that faith is not just this static belief. Uh, yes, I believe that Abraham Lincoln was born in such and such a time. I believe he was born, what, was it Springfield, Illinois? I believe that. 
Does that change me? Am I transformed? Am I transfigured by believing that? In the same way, we can believe in Jesus Christ as a historical datum or as a religious datum, whatever, and not be changed. It does us no good. It's like, congratulations, you believe in Jesus Christ. Guess what? You're still dead. You're like the demons. They believe. And they tremble. It doesn't do them a bit of good. So we're trying to learn how to believe in Jesus in such a way that we make this mystical movement from this side, you know, where, our, where our soul is completely ensnared and uh, caught up in the affairs of this life, so that our soul moves into the mystery that's eternal, into the mystery of Christ, where we come upon our true origin and our true destiny. All right, continuing with the line 59. This noetic journey into the mystery of God that is Christ in you. This is the exodus of the Bible. It's the new or the inner exodus of the gospel that was foretold. This gets to your point, Rob. It was foretold, this new exodus that we're talking about. This was foretold in one way or another by all the prophets. I've looked, I've, I've looked, at, I've looked at the prophets and I have found their references to this new exodus in all of them. In one way or another. But perhaps the most explicit example that we can bring forward would be from Ezekiel. I will take you out from the nations and will gather you out of all the lands. Okay, now if you're, if you're not initiated into the mystery of Christ, and you're reading this with profane eyes, or let's say with uh, eyes, as St. Paul would say, in which the, uh, that, that still have a veil over them, what are you going to hear? What's, what's, what's being talked about? I will take you off from the nations and I will gather you out of all the lands and I will bring you into your own land. What's that talking about? Israel. Yes, Israel. And it's talking about what? Um, um, rescue, delivering them from their current slavery to the, to the Babylonians or to the Assyrians and they're, where they're in exile. And it's about bringing them back to their own land. That's what you, that's what you would read if you're reading with the Jews who's, who still have a veil over their eyes. I, I will sprinkle clean water upon you and you shall be purged from all your impurities and uncleanness and from all your idols and I will cleanse you. Okay, so far you could say, uh, well, this is just, this, these are the Levitical sacrifices, right? The sprinkling with the water, the sprinkling with the blood of the sacrifice bowl. Okay, well, that's, that, 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 I look forward to that. As a Jew, I look forward to that. But now he goes on. I will give you a new heart. And actually, there's another passage in Ezekiel where it says, I've said this before because I really like it, the verb that is used is, I will extract the old heart from you. I will take it out. And I will put a new heart in you. Did the Levitical sacrifices do that? They did not. And that's what Hebrews means, in the epistle to the Hebrews, when it says that the blood of bulls and goats it was sufficient for its time, but it, would, it could not cleanse the conscience. You know, the, deep, the deep inner man it could not cleanse the conscience clean. And so they had to keep doing the sacrifices. I will give you a new heart, and I will put a new, a new spirit in you. I will take, okay, th actually this is the passage. I will take away the heart of stone, and that's the verb, extract. I will extract the heart of stone out of your flesh. I mean, you couldn't get more vivid than that. And I will give you a heart of flesh. What's a stony heart, do you think, versus a fleshy heart? Yes. The stony heart would be the dead heart. What would the fleshy heart? A living heart. Why are we dead in our hearts? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. <laughs> what does St. Paul say? Um, you he has made alive who were dead in your sins and trespasses. Um, so the heart is dead because of our sins, of our idolatry, are constantly missing the mark, are constantly living in such a way that we are not aligned with Christ, we're aligned with anything else but Christ. I will put my spirit in you. I will cause you to walk in my ordinances and to keep my judgments and to do them. How will he cause us to do that? Will he force us to do that? 
the Lord does not force anybody. <coughs> you know, you know, catch the vision that's being said by Ezekiel. If he's going to put in me a new heart, a living heart, well, you know, um, that means that it's going to be a heart that is aligned with Christ. And that means that the life of that heart will not be the biological life of this earth, right? It will be the, it will be the divine life of Christ. And if that's the life that's living in me, I will do the ordinances of Christ naturally. Well, think, just like I do the ways of the idols now, naturally, without thinking. No. When I am united with Christ, and I have aligned myself with Christ, and he puts to death in me the old heart, and renews in me a new right spirit, now I will live and I will walk in the way of life, the way of God, easily, naturally, without thinking. Now, there's another passage from Ezekiel that I want to bring in here. This is the one that um, we say on, uh, during a great holy week. It's said on the evening of great and holy Friday, when we are serving the matins of great and holy Saturday. We read this passage from Ezekiel that's at the top of page 3, line 73 and following. We read this passage after we have gone out of the church. Okay, already on Holy Friday, Holy Thursday and Holy Friday, um, we have performed the, the uh, rites of Christ's death and burial. And so now Christ is you know, the icon of Christ's body, now crucified. Now a corpse is been, has been placed on a tomb in the church. So on a great and holy Friday evening, at the end of the matin service, which is for great and holy Saturday, we take up the, the shroud, it's called the epitaphion, on which is the icon of the corpse of God. You know, so when they started saying in the 19th century, 18th century, was it, God is dead? Uh, the Orthodox said, yeah, we know. We know that. <laughs> but you forgot, he's also risen from the dead. So we take up that corpse and we process around the church. We go outside the church and we go around it three times. And then we come back in. And when we come back in, the priest and the altar servers have, uh, are holding that shroud up so that when we come back, we have to come in under the shroud, the epitaphion. And we lower that epitaphium for each person so that everyone who comes back into the church has to stoop down in order to get back into the church. You catch it? What's being imaged there? What's the icon of there? Going into the tomb. Because when, you know, Peter and John, they had, they had to stoop down to go into the tomb. And this also is fascinating. There's another marginal note that we'll give to you while we're off text again. Um, the verb for stoop down in Greek that you read of, that, you, that, that is in the account in John's Gospel, maybe some others as well, of uh, John and Peter stooping down to come into the tomb, it's the same verb that's used in St. Peter. I think, it's, um, I think it's the first epistle of St. Peter, where he says um, that even the, where he's talking about the mystery of God you know, the angels wanted to know. The prophets, they were wanting to know what is this, this mystery of the Christ that the Spirit is telling them about. They wanted to know. And even the angels, he says, uh, wanted to see into it. That's how it's translated in the English. But the verb there is even the angels longed to stoop down and see it. <laughs> What's that telling us? This, this is something for us to think about and to contemplate. The mystery of God that is hidden from the ages is hidden in our death. It's hidden in our death. In the tomb, I mean, the living God, the living God is hiding himself in the tomb of our death. Christ in you is the mystery of God. Christ in your heart that is dead in its sins and trespasses. That's the mystery of God in you. Christ in the tomb of your heart. Um, so, um, 
that's what's going on on Great and Holy Friday evening. Then after we've come back in, so you know, mystically, uh, iconographically, we have entered. Where have we come in? Where have we entered? What have we entered coming into the church? You get it? We've come back into the tomb. We're coming inside the tomb. We're coming inside the tomb of the Lord. Listen, guys. <laughs> At the beginning of Great Lent, what was that now? Seven weeks earlier. And actually even two weeks before the beginning of Great Lent. This is going to be another off-script marginal note. Um, two weeks before Great Lent begins, we're reading about the passion of Christ. Uh, we're reading all about his death and his trial and his death and his burial. We don't read about his resurrection. But by the time we have come to Great Lent, the beginning of Great Lent, we have already come with the myrrh-bearing women to his tomb. Which means that we are standing, that at the, end, at the beginning of Great Lent, we are at the entrance of the Lord's tomb. But, it says, they rolled a large stone over it and sealed it so that we can't get in. We can't get in. But it's inside the tomb. That's precisely where we want to get to. So what does it say? You got to understand, there's so much theology in these, in these Gospels. You can't just read them as stories. This is theology. It says, so the myrrh-bearing women, they saw the place where he was buried. They saw how he was laid. And then it says, and they turned. They turned. It doesn't say they went home. In fact, as I recall, the verb is, they turned downward. They turned downward. Upas trifo. They turned downward. And then the, the rest of the, of the passage, if, I had, if we wanted to take the time, I would get it out so I could just read it to you. It's Luke chapter 23, verse 55, and uh, maybe going into Luke 24, 1. Um, they stooped down, and they went down. It was just Luke 23, 55. Um, oh, is it 20, 55? No, it must be 57 or 50. It's the last verse of chapter 23. And it says that they... Uh, that they um, prepared spices, and then it uses a verb. They, it says that they, uh, they, uh, um, they, uh, went, they, they, they were they were quiet, in order to honor the Sabbath because it was the day of the Sabbath. But the verb there for quiet, they got quiet, whatever the translation is, is hezekiah, which for us is a technical word for prayer. Descending with the mind, into the heart, not away from the mind. We don't we don't leave the mind. We bring the mind with us into the heart, the tomb, the tomb. And they prepared ointments and spices. So the whole of Great Lent now, we undertake the whole of Great Lent from that rubric. Understanding now from what we read on the Thursday before Great Lent, that what our effort, what our Lenten effort is all about is to get inside the Lord's tomb. But we can't get inside the Lord's tomb this way because we're blocked by a stone. So we've got to find another way. And the murdering women pointed out to us the way of prayer. Going down into the heart. There working to put to death all that's earthly in us. Right there tr working to identify everything that's putting us to death. And then confessing it. Acknowledging it. Spitting it out. That's why the period of Great Lent is devoted to confession. We're confessing it. So that through the church, and so then finally on, 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 on this Great and Holy Friday of Great and Holy Week, uh, the church is, she's, you know, she's, the stone hasn't been rolled away yet of the tomb, but the church is taking us this other way. And through the rites of the church, the liturgical rites of the church, she is bringing us, she's leading us, she's taking us into the inside of the tomb by another way. And after we have come inside the tomb, so now we're inside the tomb, there in front of us is the body of Christ, the dead body, the corpse of God. Behind us are the doors that are now closed, symbolizing what? Maybe the stone that's now still sealing the tomb. But now we are inside the tomb. And that's when we read this passage from Ezekiel. I will open your graves, and I will bring you up out of your tombs, and I will bring you into the land of Israel, and I will put my spirit within you, and you shall live, and I will place you in your own land, and you shall know 
that I am the Lord. There's another way, of, another proof text, if you will, to show that faith is not guesswork, nor is it uh, a leap in the dark. Faith is knowledge. It's true knowledge. Because through faith, you get inside the tomb, right there with the Lord. Now, again, off script, but just to complete the, complete the imagery here. So we've come into the church on Great and Holy Friday evening. Uh, we're still inside the tomb. Tell me, Barb, you should answer this question. When is that stone rolled away? And when do we see the Lord rising from the dead, from inside the tomb? Exactly. Don't be so timid. You're exactly right. Exactly. And where are we in that moment? We're inside the tomb. You understand? Here, here, so here, here's the initiation, if you will. Our eyes are being opened. We're seeing into the mystery of death. We're seeing God there in the mystery. We're seeing it with our own eyes. You know, our own physical eyes. But of course, it's an icon. And it's, 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 it's veiling the invisible mystery. So as we're seeing it with our physical eyes, if we have been preparing ourselves as the church is teaching us to do and, and training us to do through the whole period of Great Lent, you know, confessing our sins and trying to straighten out our life and align ourselves with the image of God in whom we were created, our inner eyes also should be opening to some degree so that we are seeing not only with our physical eyes, but also with our inner eyes, the mystery of Christ rising from the dead. We see it from inside the tomb. So we become initiates, Init those initiated into the mystery that is our, yeah, that is the very, the, going back to origin, the mystery in which we were made. Our having been made in the image of God. You could also translate, say, our origin saying, our primary substance is our having been made in the mystery of God, hidden from the ages, the mystery of Christ in you. The mystery of Christ, crucified, dead, buried, risen from the dead, and ascended in glory. That's the primary essence of you. You were made in that mystery. That's the mystery that defines you. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. Again, going back, the Holy Fathers would say that man is an image, an icon, small i, of the icon, capital I. We are an icon of the icon because we were made as an icon in the icon. So obviously, I'm not my true self until I'm aligned with the icon, capital I. It's clear from this that your own land, the land of Israel that we've been re that we read about in these passages from Ezekiel, because that land is beyond the grave, it's clear that that Ezekiel is talking about the kingdom of heaven. And you know this goes back to a point that we made uh, in an earlier catechism session. I don't remember if it was a year ago or whatever year and a half ago. Remember we, we traced the inner Exodus of the Bible. Remember, it starts with Abraham in Haran. That's when the exodus of the Bible actually begins. After the expulsion from Eden has been completed. The expulsion of Eden, Eden begins with Adam and Eve being expelled from the garden, but it doesn't end until the Tower of Babel, when the, uh, when the nations are scattered to the ends of the earth. And now the Lord starts bringing them back through Abraham. And he says to Abraham, there in Haran, Abraham who has uh, not known the Lord yet, but now the Lord appears to him and he says, you rise up and you take me and I want to take you to a land that I will show you. He doesn't say what the land is. But we assume, because we're, you know, if we read it with, through the eyes of the muggle, you know, the profane eye, the eye that's veiled, we assume that he's talking about the land of Canaan. Well, yeah, in one way. But, it's, 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 you know, the Lord does not say, I will take you to the land of Canaan that I'm going to show you. 
He simply says, I will take you to the land. I will take, I'm going to take you to the land that I will show you. And then in Hebrews 11, you read that, and it becomes clear that the land that God was showing Abraham was the city of the kingdom of heaven. Um, so it's very clear that the land of Israel and, and, and your own land, your own land, is the kingdom of heaven that is beyond the grave. And we could, we could go into this a bit more, and we could show from the Old Testament that the land, the kingdom of heaven, is Christ. The land of your inheritance, the portion of your inheritance, is Christ. He's the land. Um, so the Lord leads us to this new land of Israel from his own grave. From the font of the church's baptism. You understand, can you see how, how, the, how powerful this is in the orthodox worship? Because we're not just talking about it. We act it out. And are acting it out in the liturgical worship of the church. That's an icon of the mystery. And the icon is a participation in the mystery. So when we act it out, we're actually participating mystically in the mystery. Nick? Is that true that every week, every Sunday as well? Every exactly. Week, we're in the two Thank you. Again again again. Thank you. Yes, we come. We, yes. Or, you know, yeah. Um, no, I, you know, I, I don't know. We have to think about that. I mean, it, 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 okay, okay, okay. Uh, but, you know, we could also say we're, we're coming into the garden. Remember that, that the Lord was crucified and he was buried in the garden. It says, in, 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 the, 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 see, in the place where he was crucified was a garden. The idea, it, it, it gives the idea that the whole thing takes place inside this garden, which is rather, um, um, you know, uh, strange. You wouldn't think of the garden as a place where you kill somebody. <laughs> so you wonder if St. Luke is, or the, the evangelists are meaning to say some theology. The place where he was crucified was in the garden. Well, was it last Christmas? We were reading from the Book of the Bee and the Cave of Treasures, and we encountered this ancient tradition um, in uh, Near Eastern Christianity that uh, Christ was crucified on the very spot where Adam fell. And what is that place where he's called, where he's crucified? What's it called? place of the skull. He was crucified right there where Adam fell and died. In other words, where he was crucified was the Garden of Eden, which has now become, because of our tense in the transgress transgressors, it's become a desert. It's become a cemetery. It's become a place of the dead. But then, where does Mary Magdalene find the Lord, the risen Lord? In the garden. You think that's just a garden that was kind of side by side with the tomb? Well, you know, physically, yeah, geographically, probably. But what if there's some theology there? What if the garden in which Mary Magdalene found the Lord is the Garden of Eden? That was, that was a desert, it was a wilderness, but now as Isaiah for, for, uh, prophesies, it blossoms like the rose. It's full, it's lush, it's become full of life. Which is also to suggest that if we're going to get into that garden of the resurrection, how do we, how, how, what's the way to get there? We're going to go around the tomb? Well, that's what you would say if you were reading that geographically. But if we're reading it theologically, no. You don't get to the garden of the resurrection except through the tomb. Which means you've got to die to yourself. You've got to take up your cross. You've got to put to death what's earthly in you. You have to crucify your earthly members. You have to die in the likeness of Christ's death and unite yourself to him, with him, in his death so that you can unite yourself to him in the garden of his resurrection. Um, so you notice how the Lord is fulfilling this prophecy of Ezekiel. And this is what is so powerful about this, this liturgical, the liturgical rites of Great and Holy Week. We're not just talking about it, we're acting it out. And in acting it out, we're actually entering into it. We're doing it. Um, um, we are, we are, and we, are, you know, we understand now, we read the prophecy of Ezekiel, not with our heads, but with our whole being. We understand now that he, when he says, I will open your graves and I will bring you up out of your tombs, he's talking about his own death. And he's going to open our graves from the inside. 
Not from outside, but from the inside, from his own death. And he's talking about his resurrection. And I will, I will, uh, I will bring you up out of your tombs. I, I, I intentionally, I, wanted to, I should have underlined that word up. I'm not just going to bring you out of your tombs. The, the verb is, I will bring you up out of your tombs. It's the resurrection. It's clear then that, uh, that, so, so that, that, what, that, that what Ezekiel is prophesying about is the death and the resurrection of Christ. And our journey, our real journey, into the kingdom of heaven, into the kingdom of heaven that is within you, into the mystery of Christ that is within you. Um, the Lord leads us to our own land in the body that he received from his holy virgin mother, in which he himself was crucified, dead, and buried, which is to say that he leads us in the Eucharistic mystery of the church. You know, his, when we receive the body and blood of Christ, we are receiving the body, the very same body that was crucified, dead, buried, and is now risen from the dead and is glorified in the ascension where he's seated at the right hand of the Father. When we partake of the Holy Eucharist of Christ's church, what does St. Paul say? Um, as often as you eat this cup and drink this, uh, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim my death. Uh, you proclaim my death until what? Until my, until my second coming, whatever, something like that. But now you understand why. You're partaking in Holy Eucharist. You are eating and drinking Christ's death and resurrection. You're not just eating his death. You're eating also his resurrection. But if you're eating his death, you're eating his death uh, by which he destroyed your death. So if you're eating his death, you are receiving the power of his Holy Spirit that enables you, that empowers you to set out to work, to take up your cross, and to put to death what's earthly in you. Not on your own strength, but by the power of the Holy Spirit that is in you. To raise you up now from your death into the resurrection of Christ. Um, and the Eucharistic mystery of the church encompasses all of the, the whole church. Yes, Mitch? So, is the Eucharist the fruit of the tree of life? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely, yeah. See, you're starting to get it. <laughs> I have a question about the Eucharist as well, Father Paul. Um, could you say that the burning bush that was not consumed by fire is also an image of the Eucharist? Because the Eucharist is transformed into the body and blood of Christ while not losing its own properties as bread and wine. It's, it's an image, a, yeah. In the church, it's the... an image of theosis, because we're... Absolutely, we're, yes. It is the image of theosis. It is the image, as you know, in the church, of the Theotokos, the Virgin Mary, who receives into herself, like the bush received, the fire, which is God. You know, God is a consuming fire, but he's not only a consuming fire, he's also a purifying fire. We receive God, like that bush. And so we become... Theotoki. We become mothers of God because we receive God into us, into, the, into, the, into our body. And I'm not making this up, okay? I would be afraid to say that if I didn't have confirmation from the Holy Fathers. They're the ones who are telling me this, and I'm telling you that you can, we become Theotoki. You know, we become daughters of the Virgin Mary. We become like our mother, the Virgin. We become mothers of Christ. And in becoming, and, and when we receive Christ, what do we say? What do we say after the after the divine liturgy? After we've received Holy Communion, we say, um, "We have found the true faith. We have received the heavenly Spirit. We have seen the true light." Um, who uh, worshiping the? Well, it's not exactly that order. But how does it go? We have found that we have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly Spirit. We have found the true faith, worshiping the Holy Trinity who has saved us. Um, we are, receiving, we are receiving the holy fire that is God himself. We are receiving the wisdom of God, right? Christ is the wisdom of God. Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 7, verses 26 through 28. And wisdom is the very brilliance of the Father. Hebrews 1, 3. He's the Son of God the very brilliance of the Father. Hebrews is simply quoting wisdom of Solomon. So when we receive the Holy Eucharist, we are receiving the brilliance of the Father in Christ. And so that's why we can say we have seen the true light. We have received the heavenly spirit. We have received the fire of God that burns us without consuming us like it did the bush. 
unless we're not aligned with Christ, then it does, then it does consume us. But it doesn't consume us. It purges everything that is dross, all the chaff, everything that is not Christ, of Christ, and therefore everything that is not of us by nature. But listen, if I have identified myself with all the chaff and all the dross, then when the fire burns up the chaff and the dross, isn't it going to burn me up too? So that's why I try to align myself with Christ, so that when the fire burns, it burns away my sins, burns away my corruption, all my dross and my chaff. But me, it purifies, and I'm transformed. I become a God, a son of the Most High, a daughter of the Most High. The time that remains, I would like to, um, let's skip over to page 10. I don't want to leave you just with these ideas to think about, although they are most worthy to think about, but you know, the Lord says, not the hearers of the word, but the doers who will be made righteous. So let's talk about what we can do, having heard the mysteries of Christ. Um, well, let's pick it up at line 343. Let's conclude with somewhat with uh, what you can begin to do. Okay, I need to work on this. I, you know. Let's conclude with what you can begin to do. With what you can begin to do. <laughs> what the Lord and his servants, John the Baptist, Peter and Paul, are telling us to do. I just, I quoted from them in the section just above this. The Lord himself is the mighty snowmelt river in the vision of the prophets, for example, Ezekiel 47, that flows from the temple the Holy Virgin Theotokos, all the way to the outlet of the sea. In other words, into your mind and into your heart. So here are some concrete things you can do to step into that mighty river and begin to be healed. Remember that wherever that river goes, whatever it touches, whatever creature it touches, it heals. Except there's a pool that it does not touch. And that pool becomes stagnant. That would be the pool of those who reject the Lord. Um... So that you can uh, begin to be to live in the Savior's life-giving death and be borne up by the current of that mighty river to the outlet of the sea into your heart and out into the deep beyond all things where we may see Jesus. Number one, here's a, you know, attend the divine services as much as you can, as much as your circumstances and schedule allow. Attend the divine services. We're not, um, because, um, in order to immerse yourself in the living waters of the Holy Spirit that carry Christ. In other words, these divine services carry Christ. I like to say, the Orthodox Church is not about Christ at all. The Orthodox Church is Christ. You come to the Orthodox Church, yeah, you hear about Christ, but that's only to uh, open your ear, your, your, your soul, so that you can eat Christ, partake of Christ, and become a Christ, become an anointed one yourself. Um, we have seen the true light we have received the heavenly spirit we have found the true faith worshiping the undivided trinity who has saved us that's what's happening in the divine liturgy and then all the services of the week you know the vespers, the matins that we serve you know, those, those are just mountains of theology and if we come to those services um, we're hearing we're hearing uh, the word of the Lord and it is touching our mind and listen, what's going to happen to you if your mind is being touched and if it's being shaped by the words of the church that you're hearing versus what you see and hear out in the world? What does St. Paul say? I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the compassionate mercies of God, that you present yourselves as living sacrifice a living sacrifice, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and well-pleasing to the Lord, which is your ration, your, your, your logikin, your logical service. Logical comes from logos, which is what we use, the word that we use to, to refer to Christ. So you could say, which is your Christological service. Um, and do not be conformed to this age, but be, you, be ye transformed 
by the renewing of your mind. How can you renew your mind if you're feeding your mind with all the junk that's out there? Are you stupid or something? How do you renew your mind? By feeding your mind, what the St. Paul says, by the renewal of your mind, um, um, uh, in order to discern, he says, in order to test what is the will of God, which is holy, uh, 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 full of joy, and, and perfect. So in other words, you know, uh, we need to, uh, we want to renew our mind by feeding it with the words and the images, the vision of the church. And then in that uh, vision, that, that, that education that we're receiving from the church, we learn to discern what thoughts in our head are from God and what thoughts are from ourselves or from man in general or worse. Uh, which is not an easy thing to do. It takes practice. And how on earth, <laughs> it just it boggles my mind, how we Orthodox Christians think that we can be called Orthodox when we're living out in the world just like everybody else. And we come to church only on Sunday morning. I just don't get it. Um, <laughs> we are then like the Israelites that Israel was that the Lord was complaining about to is Isaiah. As people draw as near to me with their mouth, they honor me with their lips, and yet their heart is far from me. And so their worship is empty. Um, this is to say, I see, okay, uh, line 356.a, uh, the consecrated bread and wine in the chalice that have become by the descent of the Holy Spirit, the body and blood of Christ, are the doctrines and the creed of the church made incarnate as our heavenly food and drink. This is to say that the, life, that the saving and life-giving mystery of Christ is given to everyone, baptized and non-Orthodox, in the prayers, in the hymns, in the scripture readings, in the holy icons, even in the movements and gestures of the liturgical and sacramental worship, worship of the church. All of these things of the church are food and drink. They're given as food and drink to our eyes, to our ears, uh, you know, the, the vision of the church, all these things that I'm telling you this morning, that I'm talking about this morning. This is the vision of the church. I'm feeding your mind with this, with the food of the vision of the church. And you can go home and your mind can keep eating it, you know, contemplating it. Um, you are being fed in these words, the vision of the church. You are being fed Christ himself. Because all of these things carry Christ. <clears throat> But all of these things, they're made, fine, they're, fine, they're made incarnate in the consecrated bread and wine of Holy Eucharist. That, you know, once you have committed yourself um, to the doctrines of the church, so that this is going to be your life, this is what you're going to um, follow in order to align yourself with Christ, now you're ready to be received into the church and to eat Christ as your food and drink in the consecrated bread and wine that become his body and blood. Because when you understand from that chalice, if you don't believe what the Orthodox teach, how on earth can you eat it from the chalice? You see? Um, so uh, line, uh, what, 366, kind of hurry up here. When you come into the church, come into the church in an Orthodox manner. And that simply means, um, I would say, you know, you can add on the margins, you don't want to become rigid. You don't want to become regimented. We're not, we, we are soldiers, but we're also children of God. So you don't come in and, uh, and, you, and you're all worried about, am I doing it the right way? You don't worry about that at all. You'll get it eventually. Come in as a child of God. Pretend like you're three years old. And just come in and you just look and you watch, you absorb everything that you're seeing and doing. So I would say, generally, generally speaking, the general way that you come into the church in an orthodox manner is to come into the church in the fear of God with faith and love. That's the primary thing. Come into the church in the fear of God with faith and love. And then on the basis of that, you start learning how to conduct your body in such a way 
that you are um, you know, fostering in yourself this fear of God, this faith and love of God. For example, make the sign of the cross. You're, 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 not, you're not yet even enrolled. You're not baptized. That's fine. Who's, who's saying you can't make the sign of the cross? The Lord says, if you would follow me, you must take up your cross. That doesn't mean wait until you're baptized. Then you can start take, making this. Then you can start taking up your cross. No, take up your cross now. And one of the ways you can do that is making the sign of the cross on yourself. And think about it. Think about your past. Your, you know what you were shaped in. You know how f- afraid they are out the, outside of the Orthodox Church of the cross. They do not make the sign of the cross. They do not wear the cross around their neck. They might have a bare, empty cross on the, you know, in their, in their, in their, in their space, but there's no body on there. It's just a tree. Why are they so afraid of the cross? So come into the church, not afraid of the cross. Come afraid. Come into the church afraid of your situation outside of the cross, apart from the cross. That's what you should be afraid of. So make the sign of the cross with these three fingers. These three fingers stand for the Holy Trinity. These two fingers stand for the incarnation, the divine and human natures of Christ. And you see it's all one. You make the sign of the forehead to the heart. And then we go from right to left. I know others go from left to right, but the Orthodox go from right to left. So when in Constantinople, do as the Constantinopolitans do. I don't know if there's any significance in going right to left, left to right. I don't know. I don't know if it's a big deal at all. But that's how we do it, right to left. So do it right to left. Um, venerate the icons. You venerate the picture of your loved one, don't you, if your loved one is away? So what, 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 what's, what's the deal about venerating the icon? The icon is of a, is of a personage, a saint, uh, that is alive. And when you honor the icon, the person, the, the, the image on the icon, you're not kissing the piece of wood. You're kissing the person that is represented on that word, the, on the, the saint that is, that is on that word. Yes, Paul? What about the saint we don't really know? So? <laughs> yeah, so sometimes it's strange. It's oh, no, it's saint. not strange at all. It's all icons of Christ. The saint is a, is a bearer of Christ, to the next point. It's the bearer of Christ. You're kissing... You're kissing, you're kiss, you're, yes, you're kissing the saint. When I kiss you, I'm not kissing Fiona. I'm kissing you. But on the same thing, same time, I'm kind of kissing Fiona. <laughs> you're kissing the Christ who is, who, is, who is in all of us, all of us saints. You're kissing the mystery of Christ. And goodness sakes, you know, the, church, the communion of the church is this communion of the saints who are in the love, who are living in the love of Christ. And, you know, you know, we do it more out in the East Coast than we do here. This is one of the things that my wife and I miss when we came, moved out to the Midwest. In the, in the East Coast, all the Orthodox kiss each other, whether they know each other or not. That's the way you greet one another on the East Coast as an Orthodox Christian. You bust them three times if you're Russian. You bust them twice if you're Greek. But everybody kisses everybody. In the Midwest, it's only the priests now that do that. My wife has talked with a couple of the prisoners here about um, uh, um, what would you say, uh, starting that tradition up here at St. Herman's. <laughs> so if you want to do that, be, feel free. You have my blessing. So don't be surprised if I start doing it. <laughs> <laughs> and you can do it to one another. Is there a part in the liturgy? Yes. Where... Greet with, yes. Yeah, yeah. What, I don't remember how was, it goes. I was at an Antiochian church one time. Yeah, they, yeah I think that's kind of hokey. Okay. And everyone started <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Now, let's be real for crime. Let's be real, you know. Okay, well, we've run out of time. Um, but um, you can read the rest of this, and we'll come back to this so that we can talk about it together. So you can read it, and then you'll be primed more to talk about it. Then I'll have to decide next week if we're going to go back to what we passed over for today on the text. You see, this is the value of having the text in front of you. I may want to go on, but uh, that's Okay. You can read what we, didn't grow, what we didn't go over, and you won't have missed a thing. And I just might well go on. You know, because we got, we got ground to cover, guys. And we don't, have, we don't have a century to do this. So let's uh, rise and say a closing prayer. And then we'll be free to go in pieces. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.
Spirit, Amen. Truly it is meet to bless you, Hothel Tolkos, ever blessed and most pure and the mother of our God. More honorable than the cherubim, him are glorious beyond compare than the seraphim. Without corruption, thou gave us birth to God the word. Truth, thou talk, we magnify thee. Christ is in our midst. He is never shall be. All right, guys.